Uh, I'm happy to be back. So I, I study computer science. So this was my, uh, my department, my building. Or not my building, but the building where I worked at and uh, studied that. So how many of you are in computer science here? That's it? Only what happened? Are they all, are they all programming outside? So uh, are, are the rest of you uh, Stanford students here or alums? I, I see some friends and alums here. That's great. So uh, I'm very happy to be here. I just flew in this morning. I scheduled my flight to, to be here for Richard's uh, talk. He told me there's going to only be 20 people, so I'm really impressed by the crowd. Uh, OK, so I'm here to talk about Bitcoin and China and, and my startup in China called BTC China. So just to make a correction, we actually, I actually got involved earlier this year. So it's been about eight months or so involved in BTC China. Um, how many of you have heard of Bitcoin? I assume almost all. And how many of you have Bitcoins? Wow, that's awesome. This is, this is why this is called Silicon Valley. You guys are all into it. This is great. And uh, if those of you who have bank accounts in China, you can buy some at my exchange afterwards. <laughs> so let's do this. Uh, I, I have two slides. I have it's an echo here. OK, so I have two, two decks here. This one is about, um, about Bitcoin in China. Another thing I could do is talk about Bitcoin at a high level. Would you guys want to go through some slides about Bitcoin at a high level? OK, so let's do that. So I first prepared this deck a few, uh, half a year ago. So some of the numbers may be outdated, but I'll, I'll update you. Essentially, let's talk about what is Bitcoin, right? So uh, we, know, we know it's a digital currency. We think it's a digital currency. But more importantly, is it really virtual currency, or is it more like money, or is it more like an asset? So what do you guys think? How many, show of hands, how many of you guys think it's really, um, really money? OK, just like. 12 people. How many? Who thinks it's an asset? Well, more. Well, guess what? It turns out money and asset have a relationship. They're not exactly the same thing, but rather, you know, money is really a subset of, uh, you know, a kind of asset, if you will. Other types of assets include stocks, real estate, gold, and money is one kind of asset. So everybody has money, right? So, so it's, a, it's the most common of all assets. And uh, more broadly, if you look at assets, so I'm going to go over some definitions of what, what makes an asset. Uh, these are the characteristics of an asset. You know, it's something useful, valuable, tangible. It's a resource and it's recognizable. And then when it comes to money, it's something more specific. It has to be acceptable, has to be durable, has to be portable, small units, has to be scarce, divisible, and uniform. So money's, money is really a subset of, of asset. And then, then you look at what is Bitcoin. So here's my definition of Bitcoin. It's really a digital asset. So prior to Bitcoin's invention five years ago, uh, the only types of digital assets are like email ad addresses or, or website URLs, ho host names. So Bitcoin is a new digital asset that's, that behaves like money. Okay, it's limited and scarce, decentralized, peer-to-peer, -peer, distributed, it's pseudo-anonymous, it's open source, free to use, and then also has many features of currency and money. So what is money? Let's, let's just go through that quickly. We have examples of uh, gold, of uh, cattle, uh, seashells, and even stones, right? large stones outside in, in some island. And then we have paper money. Right? Paper money has been around forever, it feels like. But uh, today's money is basically all fiat currency. Have you guys heard of the term fiat currency? The first reaction I get in China is they think it's a car, fiat, the car. No, it's fiat is <laughs> so, sort of derogatory term. It just means that governments declare this money is legal tender, it has value by declaration, by fiat. It turns out this wasn't the case uh, a century ago. So today's money, whether it's the US dollar, the Chinese RMB, or other, other dollar currencies, it's all fiat today. It's no longer backed by gold. It turns out in the early 1900, the US dollar was backed by gold. So the notion of gold certificates, uh, $1, one dollar bill, was one, 20, one twentieth of an ounce. I have some props. Let me see. So what I have here is one twentieth of an ounce. So here's a dollar, and this is one twentieth of an ounce of gold. This happens to be a China panda. I don't know if you can the camera zoom in. 
So this is one twentieth of an ounce. Do you know how much this is worth today? Worth sixty dollars. That's right. So one ounce is about twelve hundred dollars. <laughs> so if you give me sixty or more dollars, I might give you this piece. But it used to be that one piece of this can go. You can go to the bank and, and get one of these guys. And then if you have twenty dollars, you get one ounce of gold. Now, not so easy so much. So, um, oh yeah, it was on the screen, right? <laughs> Um, so paper money is no longer backed by physical assets, that's good or bad, but it, it, it only started in 1971. And in essence, the fiat currency regime has only been around for 42 years, which is a small sliver of the whole of humanity. So everything before that, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, they used money that was more physical and tangible, about uh, gold, silver, and so on. So today's bank, you know the history of banks came from being depositories for gold and silver. So what's the problem with fiat currency? We know about increasing money supply in the US. We use a fancy term called QE. They, a QE is an acronym for a fancy word called quant quantitative easing, which essentially just means printing money. So, uh, and uh, this is not happening only in the US, but also in China, Japan, Europe. Everyone's printing money. And if the whole world prints money at the same pace, guess what happens? We all feel, we don't feel it, because if you change exchange US dollars for euros, for Japanese yen, for Chinese RMB, if they're all increasing at the same pace, then people don't feel it. So that's what's happening in the last five years since the financial crisis. So government CPI numbers are notoriously underreported, uh, underreporting true inflation. So for example, I was in San Francisco today. I parked my car for 45 minutes. They charged me $12. $12, tw you know, 15 years ago when I was at Stanford could buy me a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, big lunch and stuff. How much does lunch cost these days at Stanford? How much? $12, wow. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, you, you know what I mean by uh, inflation. So uh, recent example, last decades, a country called Zimbabwe uh, had hyperinflation. So I was actually born in Africa in a country called Ivory Coast, but thankfully not Zimbabwe. But anyways, Zimbabwe had hyperinflation. This bank note is, what is it? 10 or 100 trillion dollars, I'll show you, I'll show you the, uh, the, what I mean by that. So they started you know, with five, 10, 20 dollar Zimbabwe notes, and this is very similar to US dollars, topping out 100, and they started having 500, 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, and then you know, 100,000 know, dollars, and then it goes to half a million, 1 million, 5 million. At that point, it's like, forget it, just keep going, right? So 25 million, 50 million, 100 million, and the, the and then I think they stopped here, $100 trillion. Billion, uh, $100 trillion. It's a little crazy. So when you have a newspaper article, front, front page list, you don't even count the number zero. You just know it's ridiculous. So we have, we've got starving billionaires on the street. We have eggs, three eggs that cost $100 billion Zimbabwe dollars. And this guy, I don't know if he's moving. It all depends on what kind of bill he has, right? If these are all $100 trillion notes, then I guess it's, he's rich. But otherwise, this is a poor guy. So how does it affect real life, right? In China, it's the same thing's happening. So this slides, these slides were made for China. So China has, inflation has been decent. You know, these were the early, you know, half, these are 50 cent, one RMB, two RMB. And uh, this is the old version of 100 RMB. This is the new version. 100 RMB is about 15 US dollars today. This is their largest note. And the analogy I use is how much did eggs cost? So in the 1980s, you know, you can get 100 eggs so you can get 1,000 eggs with 100 RMB. And then about 10 years later, you can only get 300 eggs. And today, 100 RMB can get you 100 eggs. So the question is, what happens in 20 years? Can you still buy as many eggs, uh, chicken eggs, right? So I'll talk about quickly about Bitcoin, and then I'll wrap up these slides and go to the, about China. So uh, by the way, if you have questions, just raise your hand. I, I, I'm speaking pretty fast going through these. Uh, so researchers have been studying big, uh, digital currency for a long, long time. I'm sure even Stanford uh, Computer Science Department, they've been talking about or studying this. And the problem is double spending, right? If you think about physical goods, physical goods you can give to each other, and the attributes of me giving a physical good to someone else, let's say it's this piece of gold coin. Where, do I, where is it? I lost it. No. So small, you know. If I, if I give this to someone, then... I no longer have it, they have it by possession. But as you know, in this digital age, files can be transferred and copied, emails are sent and copied. There's some seats over here in this area. And uh, the problem is how do you prevent someone from, from copying and pasting you know, 
digital currency or notes. So this is the topic of double spending. It's a very interesting research problem. And you know, it, it, it's never been solved until, until Bitcoin came along. Because did the information can be easily copied. That's a fundamental problem. So five years ago, this guy, Satoshi Nakamoto, this is a pseudonym. We don't know who he is. Uh, and I am not Satoshi, by the way. Just people ask, am I Satoshi? I'm not Satoshi. Uh, <laughs> if I were, I wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, so uh, that's what he said. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, uh, more on that later. Uh, so he published a paper. You know, it was actually September, October, what is it, late 2008, five years ago exactly. And it's the first viable electronic digital cash. It solved the double spend problem. And the way they did it was using global ledger. So global ledger is where they keep information globally distributed on all computers, keep track of how many accounts have how many bitcoins. Okay. So uh, published by 2008, Satoshi, first viable decentralized digital currency. It has all these features. It has a cap on how many bitcoins. It's uh, distributed peer-to-peer. -peer. We talked about that. And then um, I'll keep going. So the software itself was released almost five years ago in January 2009. So next month will be the first with a five-year anniversary of Bitcoin. So at that time, there were no Bitcoins in existence. And then it has an algorithm to generate these Bitcoins, and it's given away for free to people who participate in the mining process. So right now, as of today, there's a little over 12 million. Uh, it's open source, free to use, very secure, uses high-grade encryption. But same public-private key technologies that we're familiar with on the internet. Okay? Very transparent. All transactions are public. All ledgers are public, so everybody can see what's going on. And then pseudonymous. The, the, the difference is that account numbers are not linked to real people's names. So you have Bitcoin accounts that have Bitcoins in them. You don't know who has it, but at least what's in there, how it got there, who sent it, and how it's got sent, and how much is all visible. So here's a symbol. The B with the, um, with the line through it. The, the interesting thing is, you know where they borrowed this from? You know what currency they borrowed this symbol from? Bot. This is a side story. Where? Thai 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 Thailand. Thailand. So they borrowed this symbol from Thailand. You know, the US dollar has the S with the line through it. The euro has the E with the line through it, you know, and so on and so forth. So, so the side story is that of all the countries in the world, the only one that's come out to criticize Bitcoin is Thailand. <laughs> it's a true story. The central bankers say, oh, Bitcoin's bad, bad, bad. So I wonder if it's to do with the symbol. Um, anyway, so circulation is capped at 21 million. I'll explain that a little bit. Yes, please. Bitcoin's only five years old, and current circulation is half of the total. Yes, yes, I'll tell you about that. I guess how come it's going to take another 130 years to get the rest of the way out? Exactly, I'll tell you about that. So, um, uh, so, so it's growing at 150 per hour. So as we speak, over the course of the next hour, there will be 150 new Bitcoins created out of thin air. And then that, that's a rate of 3,600 a day. And then, and then it takes 130 years to get to 21 million. And then you ask, wouldn't it take much sooner? It wouldn't take, you know, wouldn't it be much faster than 130 years? The reason is that actually the speed at which the Bitcoins come out actually slow down over time. Every four years, it slows down by half. So it used to be, four years ago, it used to be 50 Bitcoins per 10 minutes, 300 per hour, 7,200 per day. So now it's half of that. In four years, it will be half of this. In four years after that will be another half of that and so on, until very, very small. So uh, that, that's how it reaches 21 million, OK? Out of thin air, what do you mean by that? Out of yeah, thin air. I'll explain that, uh, I'll explain that in, in, a, in, in the later slide. You got a question over there? OK. So how does Bitcoin work? So regular bank accounts, you all have bank accounts, right? So the US does not have an underbanking problem. But do you spend all your money? Do you spend your whole paycheck every month? That, I've heard that Americans spend all their paycheck. <laughs> so that's how you know. So that's why when I see you know zero for your bank account balance, I don't know if it's a start banking account balance or whether that's your current bank account balance. But anyway, so let, uh, this sorry, this is in RMB yuan. But the idea is you you when you deposit money to your bank, you put in the cash. They don't track the serial numbers of the cash. They just say, oh, you know, we'll we'll keep track of it, one thousand you know dollars or whatever. And then when you withdraw, they just you're just minus 300 and you're left with 700, right? So that's called a ledger system, okay? For those of you account accountants. Uh, but these ledgers are kept privately by the bank. 
and then uh, only known by the bank. Okay, but Bitcoin is stored in a public ledger. What happens is this information is stored repeatedly, copied everywhere around the internet for the whole world. So many copies, that's why it's called distributed. And uh, same thing, we got bank account numbers, we got Bitcoin account numbers, and then in each big account account, there's the number of Bitcoins, okay? So the, in this case, Bitcoin accounts are not just numbers, but letters. So this would be an, an example of a Bitcoin account, this long string of number, uh, numbers and letters, uppercase, lowercase, and so on. And the same thing, you start with the balance, zero, and then you put some Bitcoins in there, you take some Bitcoins out, you know, and you keep track of how much you have. So that's why in the digital world, Bitcoins don't exist by themselves, unlike real money. Bitcoin only exists as a number in an account, as a ledger. Does that make sense? So when we ask how many Bitcoins you have, you don't actually have the Bitcoins. What you do is you have access to account numbers that have Bitcoin in them. It's a small distinction if you care, please. You talk about mining? Yeah, yeah, I'll tell you about that later. So in the world, there's only three ways to get Bitcoins today. The first way is the mining process. I think we'll, uh, I'll come back to that. It's the same question, I'll come back to that. Uh, Bitcoin is just a uh, public, okay, so we'll just, yeah, and then, and then you use a pu public private key, so the Bitcoins in a Bitcoin account are locked by a password, if you will, a long, a very long password, and that's like the private key to the Bitcoin address account, okay? So a wallet is a terminology, you know, it's computer science people came up with these terms, I didn't come up with these. So uh, a wallet is like a collection of Bitcoin accounts, that you put in your computer. Okay, so you have to keep that secret. Anyways, com compared to fiat currency, I, I remember your questions and we'll come back to that. Compared to fiat currency, Bitcoin has a limit, a hard limit of 21 million. However, it has many more decimal places. So can you think of a currency that has two decimal places? US dollar. US dollar. Can you think of a currency that has zero decimal places? Japanese, Japanese, yeah. Japanese yen, that's right. Can you think of something that has eight decimal places? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> and, and what? Oh, Ripple. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, yeah, crypto, same, same class. Uh, so it's not controlled by government, okay? That, that's very important. So not controlled by government. It is uh, issued by the people running the program. And uh, you get, it's worldwide. It, it crosses all cultures, all language, all countries, all barriers. So it runs on the internet. Anonymous transactions very low transaction fee, and also the notion of no chargeback, the notion of finality. So how many of you have businesses where you accept credit cards? Any business owners here? The notion, oh, we have a few, okay. So the notion, if, you, if, you, if you're a business, a restaurant, you take credit cards, if your customer pays by credit card, you're supposed to get that $40 for their lunch, but in reality, you'll find out a month later where you get the money. Sometimes the bank calls you and say, oh, that was fraud, sorry, we're not gonna pay you. So there's a risk of taking credit card. That's why they, they charge such high fees and so on. So with Bitcoin, once you accept the Bitcoin, once you have proof you got it, there's, it's, 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 it's sure thing. There's no uh, risk of not getting it. And there's no such thing as a fake Bitcoin because everything can be authenticated. So uh, from that perspective, merchants really like accepting Bitcoins. Open source peer-to-peer. -peer. So conclusion, uh, quickly three things, okay? We got the asset value aspect. So the, the key notion here is Bitcoin, because of its limited supply and its, va and its, and its uh, uh, functions and properties, like no counterparty risk, it makes it really a valuable asset. The second thing is it's very, it has high integrity because of the transparent nature, decentralized global network. Uh, the notion of um, it's open source and, and, and uh, open for inspection. So everybody can go inspect the security aspect of it. And lastly, it's very secure and safe because of the high grade encryption. Uh, so Bitcoin itself is very secure, but you still, once you have Bitcoin, you have to keep track of your, of your private keys. You, you, you don't want to lose it. It's like, if, if I give you like five kilograms of gold, you don't want to just leave it on your living room counter, right? You want to lock it away in a safe. So it turns out Bitcoin is very much like gold. It's an electronic version of gold with many properties. And um, now let me run over some prices and I'll talk about the mining aspect. So uh, how many of you heard about Bitcoins in 2011? Wow, I am impressed. Did you guys buy it back then? See, if you bought it, you wouldn't be here, right? You'd be like vacationing somewhere. So I did not buy any Bitcoins either, so too bad. But, um, but, uh, but back in 2011, there was a bubble 
right? People call it the big bu Bitcoin bubble of 2011. So it went from a few dollars, you know, under one or two dollars, for those of you who remember, those are good old days. Uh, and then it went all the way up to $30, and it came crashing down. And we were like, oh, see, this is virtual currency just for kids, forget about it. So it ended up being $10. And that's when my brother introduced me to Bitcoin. I started mining it. I'll tell you about that later. Uh, so peaked over $30. And then this year, uh, I, I got involved, and that's what, no, it's not because of me, but, uh, <laughs> no, I got involved around here, started buying, and I told the rest of the world, please buy, please buy, and then, no, no, no that's a joke also. Uh, people think it's a Ponzi scheme, but it's not. So, um, so the price did indeed keep going up. This is a U.S. dollar chart. So by April this year, how many of you bought Bitcoins this year, around March, April? So there was a Cyprus event. You know, where the, the government says, oh, you banks with your money, let me just take a big chunk out of it. And people got all worried about putting money in, in banks. So uh, that's what triggered the Bitcoin stuff. And in April is when the mainstream media started covering it. Uh, so it peaked out at about $265 uh, on, a, on a big Bitcoin exchange. And then guess what happened? It popped, right? So um, it popped and it came back down to about $100. So it went up, it's like near vertical, comes back down. But you'll notice this time, by going from $20, $30 to $260 and coming back down, this, is, this looks like a bubble, right? Looks like the dot com bubble crash of the 1999 or 2000. But what happens is the previous bubble in 2011 looks like a small speed bump. In comparison, I mean, it was a bubble too, but it's like it's much smaller. It's like almost like fractal behavior. You guys study fractal, fractals in computer science. Anyways, so uh, this is interesting. So I was like, hey, this this might keep happening. Uh, so sure enough, later this year, you know, it went up again. And you know, this time, it's the Chinese people buying it, uh, and I was involved. I'm, I'm guilty. So I'll tell you about that in a little bit. So, so prices hovered around $100 this summertime, the su su summer doldrums, and it went up. And then by late September, we actually, I'll tell you about what a company did, but, but, the, but the prices kept going up. So now, what do you think is going to happen after October? Do you guys know the price of Bitcoin today? It's a little crazy. So, so I'll show you the next slide. This is, where, this is where it gets killer. So it turns out, in the last two months, it went from 200 US dollars to $1,100. Okay, crazy growth here. And it makes the April bubble look like a speed bump and makes the March, sorry, the, the 2011 look like ants. I mean, this, this was the same curve you saw in like four slides ago that was very steep. And, uh, you know, so this is kind of crazy, huh? So you saw this bubble, and it's not quite a bubble after all when you see this big guy. And the question is, what's going to happen in the next two years, five years? Will it come crashing down and, and that's it? Or will there be bigger and bigger price increases that make this guy look like this guy? Interesting question. So I know what I think, but uh, I don't want to bias your thinking. OK, so some common misunderstandings. So Bitcoin does not replace government fiat currency. So the proposal is not to say the whole world would get rid and burn all the dollars, burn all the euros, and get rid of it. That's not the point, OK? So anyone who says Bitcoin will never replace fiat currency, I'm like, you're right. It won't. Uh, and then secondly, goods and services don't need to be pr uh, priced in Bitcoin. So even when I went parking or if you have lunch somewhere, you don't have to. It, the, the pricing doesn't have to show Bitcoin price. But, but, but what we're saying is, in theory, you could pay for it using Bitcoins, right? And then lastly, the security aspect. People say Bitcoin is not safe and so on. But the reality is Bitcoin itself is very safe. It's just that you, don't want, you, want, to, you want to safely store it yourself. It's like gold itself is very, it has strong integrity. It's not going to melt or disappear or vaporize. So gold is very solid and uh, stable, just like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is very solid and stable. Just make sure you take good care of it. So it's the, the fault, let's, let's say I put a junk, let's say I put this right here, right? You know, I put it right here. And I walk out of the bathroom, you guys talk, and then I come back half an hour later, it's gone. So whose fault is that? Is it me or is it the gold? It's me. Same thing, right? If I have Bitcoin, I have Bitcoin right here, by the way. Uh, this is now worth $1,000. Huh? You can't, you can't have it. <laughs> so if, you, if you take it, then you're stealing it. But, but, um, but let's say I have this Bitcoin here, I leave it here, and then I can't find it later. It's my fault. The fault is not because of the Bitcoin, OK? So. Um, so uh, one more thing, 
this people ask, uh, people are worried about Bitcoin, whether it has value. What can you buy with it? So the analogy is, uh, th th so, the re so this is a misunderstanding. Uh, what I want to get across is Bitcoin has value not because of what you can buy from it. It's the other way around. Once Bitcoin has value, you will be able to buy things with Bitcoin. Okay, so, so this is what I'm saying. Yeah, so you will be buy things with Bitcoin once Bitcoin has inherent value and a market value. Okay, so here's, the, here's a chart for you, for those of you who didn't follow what I was saying. Uh, has unique properties, we went over that. It's scarce and limited. No misspellings, okay, good. I spelled it wrong last time. Uh, and has market value and market price. So think about that, it has features that make it valuable, then, then it has value. With value comes a market price, right? For example, what is this? A bottle of uh, Safeway water. Is this, does it have unique features that make it valuable? Yes. Does it have market value? Yes. Does it have market price? Does it? It has a, has a sell price, but does it have a bid price? Will someone offer me money to take it off my hand? Does it? Yes, no? Yes. Yeah, if you're thirsty, yes. <laughs> so, um, so it has market price, and then are people willing to accept it? So once it has market price, then people are willing to accept it, because then they can say, okay, I could sell it, I could trade it, right? If you can think of this gold, right? For most of you out here, except you're, if you're work, unless you're working in the, in the chip industry where you can actually turn the gold into, into chips, most of you have no use for gold, am I right? What you do with it is you might sell it to someone else who will pay you cash for it. So once it has value, yes, question? But gold is beautiful. <laughs> so is water. This is like transparent, you know? Water, water keeps you alive though. But like, yeah, what, gold is, doesn't what does keep a Bitcoin you alive. There you do? go. Yeah, but, but you know, you can make it into a ring or give it to someone. Yeah, absolutely right. So it's, in the end, it's to each his own. To each her own, to each his own. Okay, so where this gold, water, or Bitcoin? Some people will find gold more valuable, more attractive than others, and same with Bitcoin. Some people are more belie are bigger believers of Bitcoin. Some people will be smaller believers or believers of Bitcoin. But the point is, once enough people think it has value, it will have a market price. Today, Bitcoin already has a market price. This thing here, you know, it's made of copper or tin, whatever, but it has a password on the back to the account number, and this is worth over a thousand U.S. dollars today. A little crazy. So people, once it has market value, people will to accept it. If I go to Safeway today. And I say, hey, I tell the cashier, I want 10 cases of this water, and I'm going to give you this. And if he's smart, he would say, yeah, I'll take that, you know. So uh, when they start accepting it, then people can, what, buy things with it. And when more people can buy things with Bitcoin, what happens? The cycle goes back, and there's more value. So that's the, that's the value chain for Bitcoin. Okay, future Bitcoin cannot be stopped because unless you turn off the internet, it's peer-to-peer, -peer, it's, it's, it's kind of like BitTorrent. It crosses all firewalls and stuff like that, so it cannot be stopped by the government or by a country. It cannot be confiscated because it's just numbers you can store in your head. You can't confiscate it. It turns out, you know, which you know there's a country that's actually confiscated gold from, from its people. Have you heard of that? Yeah, United States, that's right. This very country at one point confiscated all gold, made gold illegal. So uh, even if they make Bitcoin illegal, they won't be able to confiscate it, okay? Um, and lastly, we're saying that Bitcoin exchanges will be more and more regulated by government. So uh, some of us know it better than others. <laughs> um, we're facing the same problem. We'll chat afterwards. <laughs> uh, especially today, yeah. What a crazy day. Uh, well, well, I'll share with you that in a little bit. Question? question. Uh, why can't US bank accounts be linked to most exchanges? And then why can Coinbase do it but no one else? What was the last question? Well, so could Coinbase uh, offer can link to US bank accounts, but no one else can? Uh, that's not a question I can address in this talk. I'll, I'll talk to you afterwards about that. Thank you. Yes, so they confiscated bitcoins from from some some per person who was operating an, Ill an illegal business. So if you if you are well, not you, but if someone were to operate an illegal business selling marijuana and cocaine. And then the F, uh, who would it be? The DEA comes in and busts them and takes all their money and all their drugs, you know. So it would be, it'll be similar to that. But the problem is not with the, the money. The problem is not with the cash. The problem is with the operator of the business. They were doing something illegal, right? So this is the year of Bitcoin. 
uh, more users, more startups, etc. Okay, so quickly, let me go through mining, okay? So it turns, on, it turns out that, how are Bitcoins created? So, so let me, before I do that, it turns out you can only get Bitcoins one of three ways. I want you guys to, anyone sleeping here? No? Okay. <laughs> so, so, yes, which three ways can you get Bitcoins? Mining. What, what's number one? Raise your hand so we can call you out. Buy. Number one is mining. I heard that. What's, what else? Raise your hand. Buying. Mining. Buy. Buy. There we go. That's the second method. What's the third method? Sell something. Sell something. Barter. Give me something. I'll give you. Actually, will I? What kind of computer do you have? I'll trade you the MacBook Red. Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So buying, mining, or or barter, trading it. Okay. That's the only three ways you can do it. So for Bitcoin exchanges, what we specialize in is allowing people to buy and sell Bitcoins. Okay, and then the other companies that allow people to do mining. But what I'm gonna talk about now is the mining part quickly, and then we're gonna go to the slide about China. Okay, so the process of, of obtaining Bitcoins is called mining. You obtain it for free. So let me, let, me, let me backtrack a little bit. So the guy who designed it, created it, decided to set a limit to, by 21 million. We remember that? We, he set a hard limit, 21 million. Now, how did the thing came up with that? Was that a just random number, or was that through consensus? So actually, it doesn't matter how you came up with it. What's important is the limit is set, okay? So it's kind of like if there's a skyscraper, before you build it, the architect decides how many floors, how high, it how tall it should be. So that decision has been made in the architecture design of the skyscraper. And then you start building it one floor by one floor by one floor, okay? So, so my point is the, 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 the height of the building was set before the building was built. Same thing. The, the number of Bitcoins was set before Bitcoins was sent out, okay? So if you're the inventor of Bitcoin, you decide on 21 million, who should get the 21 million Bitcoins? How many choices are there? Give me some examples, raise some hands. Everyone. Okay, so, so who was that? Okay, everyone, what do you, what do you mean by everyone? I'm like one person, per, one per person sure. in the world, okay? That's one way. You, you give it evenly to all the citizens of the world. What's another way? Lottery. A lottery. You give it out to whoever wants to come to the lottery. That's the second way. What's the third way? Just make the protocol accessible. Make what? Make the protocol accessible. Make the protocol accessible. That doesn't answer my question. Who should get the 21 million bitcoins? Oh. So I'll tell you, if, if it were me, I could say, oh, give it all to me first. <laughs> right? <laughs> right. So basically, I take all the bitcoins, and then I'll see who are my good friends and bad friends, and I'll give to some. But if, if I did that, my, my coin probably wouldn't be successful. So he didn't do that. So what he decided to do was this. He decided to give all the coins away for free to the whole world. However, th there's, a, there's a mechanical process. Basically, there's logistics. H how do you decide who's alive, who's not? Another way to do is give it to the government, right? Give it to the United States government or give it to the, to the People's Republic of China. So that wouldn't work either, right? So he decided to give it away for free to everyone, and he decided to do it at a, at a, at a time where half the coins are given away in the first four years. And then the next four years, half of that are given away, half the remaining ones are given away. And then every four years, fewer and fewer and fewer Bitcoins are given away. But it's given away for free. And the way you get it for free is you bring a computer, you run a program, and you do one calculation. For every one calculation, you get a lottery ticket. So it's a free lottery for everyone. 25 Bitcoins are given away every 10 minutes. That's today. It turns out four years ago, they gave out 50 Bitcoins every 10 minutes. Okay, you got that? So it's a free lottery. It really is free. So if you guys heard about Bitcoin five years ago, four years ago, you could have run this program. You can get, you just press lottery ticket after lottery ticket. I'll do a live example. I'm Satoshi Nakamoto. I put this program out here. For the first lottery, I raised my hand. All right, no other, okay, I win. All right, I got my first 50. That's what happened, he got his first 50. Second 10 minutes, okay. Oh, oh, all right, okay, 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 got it. So it's one of us, you know, you get one fifth chance. Okay, the third time, all right, more people. Okay, the fourth time, the fifth time, the sixth time, you know, I'm gonna raise two hands. <laughs> what the heck, you guys, too many of you out there. The sixth time, what happens? So everybody's raising two hands, and then what's happening is, if you have more computers, you, you press a button twice, you have more computers come on. So the more computers you bring to raise hands for you, the more chances you're, you have at winning the lottery. Does that make sense? And this is what the, what the game is about, the mining game. So today, you hear about people going, buying specialized computers and plugging them in 
just to, you know, <laughs> play this. Okay, I, I'm serious. I'm, I'm really serious about this. It's a big business. So play the lottery, run the program, guess the number. This is where the, where the crypto hash stuff comes in. Um, and you get the prize, okay? So uh, the difficulty, so it turns out, if there are more people playing the game, what happens? Your chance of winning goes down, right? Yes, no, yes, yes, Leslie, no, yes. Okay, so what, what they did was they ran programs on their CPUs and then it turned to GPUs, these are the graphics chips, and then they made special chips to do it, they call A6, so it's gotten harder and harder and people join into pools. So what happens is, if I'm raising five hands and I can't win, what happens, I tell my whole Stanford computer science department, hey, let's all do this together. You know, let's join as one team. We'll raise hands together and we, and we, we try to win the, the lottery. And if we do win it, we'll split it evenly amongst ourselves. And that's called a mining pool. So everyone's doing that now. So I got into this 2011, my brother introduced me to it. My first mining rig, ta-da. I spent $1,000 on that. Uh, you, you know, two power supplies, four graphics cards, two in, so it, you know how fast it, it raised hands? It raised hands 220 million times a second. So every second, brah, 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 like that, 220 million times a second. Okay, no joke, no joke. So after the course of 10 minutes, the prize comes out. Did I win? Nope. There are way too many people raising hands out there. So I didn't win. But anyways, oh, but I joined these mining pools, so I got fractions of a Bitcoin. So over three months, I earned about 20 Bitcoins. At the time, it was $300. I was like, this is not profitable. Turn it off. So I turned it off. Ah, uh, what a waste. <laughs> so today, this year, I got excited again. My brother called me, he's like, Bobby, there's this new thing called ASIC chips. These are chips designed for Bitcoin mining, made in China. And now it's 80 times, 85 times faster. So I got one of these boxes under my desk. It cost me $1,500. There's like a five month waiting list. And uh, anyways, at one point I was earning two Bitcoins a day. Two Bitcoins a day. So, so you think, wait, wait, I thought the prize was 25 Bitcoins per ticket, right? Then how, how do I get something less than that? So it's the mining pool. By doing the mining pool, we win once every so often and then we, we divvy it up. So, so I got my share, which was two Bitcoins a day. So that was the peak. That was my absolute peak. I got two Bitcoins a day. At the time it was $100, so it was that. Okay, so, so this was 72 giga hash. 72 billion times a second. The other guy was 220 million times a second. So this thing is, this race is going faster. It's like the arms race, like super fast, okay? So um, anyways, so this answered the question. So at the time we were making, yeah, yeah difficulty will rise, okay? So that's it. Bitcoin is, uh, you know, buy some Bitcoins and, uh, so let me take some questions and I'll go about, talk about China. We have half an hour left. Yeah, okay, good. Yes, question. The difficulty is rising. Why not just abandon Bitcoins and go to Litecoins or the next new coin? It's you easy. could. You could. It's, it's personal choice. Uh, Bitcoin right now is still the most, most uh, desired of all cryptocurrencies. It's because it's the original. And it turns out, uh, of, of the ones you mentioned, uh, these guys are all, there's a whole bunch. There's about 50 or 60 cryptocurrencies. You could, you could do your own. Are, are you a computer science student? No. Do you have a computer connection? Yes. You can go download Bitcoin source code. Change the name. What's your name? Wayne. Wayne. You can call Wayne Coin. Tell me send an email to everyone else to come use it, and maybe we'll use it. But but the th but there are millions of people using Bitcoin today. So the question is, will they use yours or will they use Bitcoin? So that's the question. A right, question in the back. Um, regulation wise, right? If you want to start a new star, which country would you recommend to? Which culture? Which country? Which country? China. Yeah, regulation wise. <laughs> Wait, what, what wise? Regulation. Regulation wise. Yeah, yeah. Uh, not Thailand, not the U.S. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it's it, that's a long question. I'll I'll talk about that at the end. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, over there. What do you think the have you seen a killer app for Bitcoin in China, or what do you think it will be? Because I'd say one of the challenges in the U.S. has been people are excited, but it's not clear in dollars. It's, 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 we're still very early. Uh, killer apps, you know, people think exchanges was a killer business. It, it is, it isn't. There, there's more to come. There's many, many more to come. So uh, keep, if you're interested, just stay, stay, stay in tune with the market. There's a lot more killer apps coming. Yeah, question? Like uh, because my brother invented it. <laughs> no, really. My brother, Charles Lee, he created Litecoin. So he, he did what Wayne was going to do. He went out there, pulled the source code, changed it to Litecoin, changed a few things, and published it. And for those of you who know, you know, it's, it's now pretty popular. It's the second most popular cryptocurrency. 
Yeah, so he's the guy who got me into Bitcoin and he did like He didn't even tell me about it when he launched like <laughs> he was like he was like doing this himself and he didn't tell me about it. <laughs> okay, question? Hey, yeah, here first and then the back. Yeah. Uh, so how do fractional bitcoins where does it appear from? Fractional bitcoins, um, each bitcoin has eight decimal places, so you could send 0 0.5, 0 0.55, 0 0.005 to anyone you want. But when you mine them, what do you get? Do you get you mine one every coin? anytime one price comes out, it's 25 bitcoins. And then whoever gets it can then split it up to however many pieces they want. Okay? Question in the back. Uh, at the Bitcoin exchange, how do you earn money? Okay, I'll tell you about that in the next slide, okay? So, one more question and I'll change slides. Go ahead. Sorry, in the back. Do you, have, do you have any idea of how many people hold Bitcoin? No idea. We can know, we can tell you how many accounts there are. Do we know, there's any experts here, how many accounts there are? How many Bitcoin addresses on blockchain? It's, it's in, the, in, the mil, in the hundreds of millions or billions, but we don't know how many people are behind that. Yeah. Okay, so, so here's, we're gonna spend a, maybe another 15 minutes talk about Bitcoin in China, and then, and then we'll take questions and answers, and I'm here until, you know, where, where, whenever you guys are, wanna ask more questions. Okay, so I'm a co CEO, co-founder of BTC China. We started out being uh, a local regional operator. We still are a local regional operator in China. But, uh, but we, our traffic has gone up a lot, so, so now we're getting some worldwide attention. So quick history, the site was launched by my two co-founders in June of 2011, and then, um, and then I joined this year as CEO and co-founder in April, and we, at that time we became the world's number five largest Bitcoin company. Uh, by July, we established a company, we went out fundraising uh, for VC money. We set up office, headquarters office in Shanghai, and by then we climbed to world number three position. Um, and in late September, we eliminated all trading commissions. So that was industry first to spur the Bitcoin market in China. Uh, and then by, by, by early November, we've risen to world number one position in Bitcoin volume trading. So that's, and, and later in September, or sorry, later in November, two weeks ago, we announced our Series A funding by Lightspeed Venture Partners. Uh, that's our VC money. And today, we, we, we've, so we essentially, we expanded really fast from two to 25 employees and our trading volume has gone up. So give you some perspective. Um, so the, the line is the price and then bars are the volume, okay? So we, pr we saw pretty stable price and volume all summer long, right? You remember, you remember these crazy charts I showed you? That was because I compressed the time, but when you spread it out from June to September, it was pretty much pretty flat, the price, okay? The volume was pretty flat, and then when we announced the, the, the low commission, the no commission, our volume took off. Okay, that's a bar. And then what happened, the price took off as well. So this is weird. If you think about economics, what thing gets more expensive as more people buy it? It's usually the way around. Usually when price comes down, volume goes up, right? If a car, you know, if they reduce the price for, for, for a car, for a model of a car, what happened? It spurs the sales, the sales go up, right? But this is sort of the opposite. What you're seeing here is, the volumes go up, and the price goes up. Stock market share. Stock market share. So it's something very limited in quantity. Something that has true limitations in quantity. That's what you see, right? When you see the volume go up first, and then the price go up, okay? So on, on the, just by coincidence, on the day we announced our VC funding, Bitcoin price doubled. So I remember we were preparing the press release on Saturday, Sunday, we're gonna release it Monday morning. At the time, over the weekend, it was 2,500 yuan RMB. And by the time it hit the press in the morning, it was 3,000 yuan. It went for 4,000, it went to 5,000. By evening time, we couldn't sleep. My wife and I were in the bed, we couldn't sleep. It was like 6,000, and the next morning was 7,000. So that one day, November 18th, was a key day. It went up like double the price. And that's probably when you guys all heard about it. Question? Yeah, so, um, you obviously overtook Mt. Gox at some point. In, in yeah, in early November. Okay. Um, now, they are obviously known for having well, set the, the industry standard in terms of fees, and there's been a lot of complaints around the. Uh, you you say uh, you you have no commissions. How do you see that working out long term? Is that sustainable? Yeah. Um, we'll see. I can't I can't comment on what we will do in the future, but the example I'll point out is in the past. If Google, Hotmail, and Twitter all charged per search per email sent or per Twitter sent, the internet will not be where it is today, right? Not just that, but to spur the whole industry, to spur the whole industry. And I think, we're, we, I think we've made a positive impact there. 
uh, right? If you think about web, if web search was paid, if Hotmail, Yahoo Mail, Gmail accounts were paid for, every email you sent had to be paid. I don't think the internet would be where it is today. If every Facebook like, if every Facebook message, if every Instagram thing was paid for, you had to pay for it. I don't think the internet would be where it is today. So I was up close and personal in front with the internet, you know, 20 years ago out here in Silicon Valley. So our thinking was, that's why we went to raise the VC money. We, wanna, we want the long haul. We, want, we don't want the short-term profits. We want the long-term industry success for Bitcoin. So. Well, or is that something well, we're, we're strictly focused on the China market. So China, RMB, strictly only China. China. Yeah, okay. So uh, more questions? Yes, one more. Uh, you probably saw the article this week in The Economist, which basically says Bitcoin is a giant bubble. If you're a prudent investor, you would dump it now. What, what do you think of that? Uh, I'll, t I'll answer that question at the end. Okay, hold that question. Very good question. Yeah. You, you want to sell me some Bitcoins? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take it. I'll sell you some. <laughs> the good thing is there isn't. So, so we did a user survey, uh, customer survey, who are our users. So quickly, we had about 45,000 responses, uh, 15 days. We gave out an iPad. Um, I, I, I say this because to be all fair and honest, right? Because if you think about it, surveys are never accurate, you know? So in our case, we, we told people to take the survey and there's a prize. So sometimes that skews the, the audience, but, but it is what it is, so uh, here are the results. 90% uh, 90, 90 male, so predominantly we think our users are predominantly male. Uh, <laughs> no, it's true, it's true. So where are all these female Bitcoin users? I don't know. Um, so, uh, and then, uh, you know, young, 40, 30 age, you know, predominantly. And then, uh, this is very interesting, education level, very high level of education. So the national average in China is 27% holding a university degree. But in our user study, over 90% have had university, bachelor, master's, or even PhD degrees. So it's very, very high. It's a very well-educated crowd, people who understand Bitcoin. And why are they buying it? So the predominantly is for, is for investment, either long-term or short-term. I put them in the same bucket. It's basically two sides of the same coin. Uh, and then very few people are buying Bitcoin today in China for the purpose of spending it. So this is the behavior in the Western world. We're seeing this in, in the US. People, buying, people use Bitcoin to buy things, pay for things. In China, this hasn't caught up yet. China is still in the early stages. People primarily buying it for the appreciation value potential. Okay. And then investment level experience. This is, um, so it turns out the more experienced you are, the more you buy it for long-term holding. The least experienced you are in investing, sort of maybe by age or whatever, you just use inexperience, you're just speculating. You're just buying and selling and flipping it. Okay, this is where we're seeing in China. This, I guess this is intuitive. Here's an interesting slide. So six months ago or eight months ago, predominantly Bitcoin was traded in US dollars. The, of all the world's exchanges, most Bitcoins were traded in US dollars. And what we saw happen in, in the course of six months in China is that by November, there are more Bitcoins traded using RMB than in the US dollar. So this is uh, pretty crazy. So, uh, and then let's talk about why the adoption in China. Why the fast adoption in China? Uh, these are the four reasons I cite. Uh, some of these are more publicly known. China is a nation of savers, so high savings rate. Also, it's very strong in math and science. A lot of Chinese people like are good at math and science. They study math and science engineering. Bitcoin mining is very, very popular in China. All the electronics, all the chips, all the supply chain is all in China for mining. And then also the people in China are, are just eager to participate in anything new. So there's that wow factor, the it factor, okay? So nation of savers, so this is about the, the country, you know, uh, you know, big GDP and uh, people save for the rainy day, you know, poor social, health, social care system, welfare system, underdeveloped financial sector. For all these reasons, people tend to want to save, okay? undervalued currency and so on. Um, essentially, Bitcoin presents as a great opportunity to store value and to preserve spending power, purchasing power, okay? I know you guys think it's crazy. You spend all your paycheck every month, right? <laughs> Mostly. What, what's the joke? You guys, Americans spend, yeah, more than their paycheck, yeah. And how do you get the financing? Credit, Credit cards. Card. And China. Yeah. <laughs> a student debt. You take, a, you take another home loan, home equity loan. Uh, I don't know, you mortgage your ch children, you know. <laughs> so
So second thing is a nation of engineers, right? So China, in China, engineering doesn't have that uh, stigma attached to it when you study engineering. In the U.S., you know, you know, there's the term like geeks, you know, like nerds, you know. So I mean, I, I was computer science. I was an engineering student, so I know, I know, uh, it's not uh, well. At Stanford, it's okay. At Stanford, you know, there's the there's the techies and the fuzzies, right? But most, a lot of people out in other universities get liberal arts degrees. So um, it turns out political lead and business leaders are much more likely to have engineering background in China. Uh, this is just a reflection of the society in China, right? So this is true at the national level, the government level, national, state, city level, and all that. So here's the next slide. So it turns out if you look at the background of, our, of, of the presidents of China, the leaders, the premiers, all three of these guys, do you guys know these people? Yeah, no, yes? Well, this is the guy in charge now. Uh, Chairman Xi Jinping, and this is uh, his predecessor, Hu Jintao, and the, the one before is uh, Jiang Zemin. So they all have engineering degrees. Electrical engineering, hydraulic engineering, chemical engineering. So imagine finding that at the White House or at the Senate or the House, <laughs> right? So not very popular in the U.S. Oh, you know what they are in the U.S.? They're all lawyers. Okay, and that's why you have U.S. regulation on Bitcoin by lawyers. So that's the question. That's the answer. Uh, okay. So why do you purchase Bitcoin? So that most, so most of the other reasons is because they think it's a novelty. It's like, oh, it's something new. Let's, you know, we're bored. We just want to try something new. So they're buying Bitcoins. The it factor. Okay. So government regulation. So here's a caveat. The next few slides is a caveat. So it turns out on my flight over here, they said Bobby left the country. So let's put regulation in now. No, but it, it's sort of a joke, but uh, that's what happened. I got on the plane, and then when I landed, there's a big news. In China, they're about, they're, there's some regulation stuff going on. So I, I cannot comment on that yet, because I haven't read the paper. I cannot officially comment on that. I'd be saying things wrong. So everything you see here is based on um, my thoughts you know, from, from last week and before. Okay? So apologize for that. And please don't quote me in the press for anything I'm about to say about re Chinese regulation. So they don't like, they obviously, well, I shouldn't even say that. Okay, but my point is, I, I'm see, see, I'm not, I'm not these guys, right? So they're in power. I'm just following what they say. So, um, so there's optimism uh, for for Bitcoin in China. So it turns out the vice minister of the central bank made some positive comments. There's widespread coverage by CCTV, the state television channel, and uh, so this is this is a guy Yi Gong. This he's a uh, he's a very powerful guy. He's the vice minister of the People's Bank of China, which is a central bank. He also runs the State Administration of Foreign Exchange. So he made, uh, he, he's the most knowledgeable and the most suitable person in the whole government to be commenting on and to be regulating Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin ever gets regulated in China, uh, then they will go to him for his advice. And you know, he, he'd be most likely the person to lead the effort. In fact, I think that's what's happened in the last 24 hours. So, so in November, he commented three things. Basically, he said, the, the government cannot recognize Bitcoin's legal status as a currency in the near term, uh, which, which, is, which is okay, which is to be expected, right? Uh, and then secondly is, however, he said, uh, in China, people should have the basic right to buy and sell Bitcoins. So essentially, it, it protects our business, which what we do is we allow people to buy and sell Bitcoins. So our business is now considered no longer in the blacklist. It's now in the white list of things that are approved, right? And um, with caveats, with conditions and, and rules and stuff like that. Uh, and then uh, Bitcoin's very interesting, you know, so he will keep following it. So a lot of coverage in the state media, television. And uh, so the future is bright, I think, for Bitcoin in China. And uh, yeah, so a lot of Bitcoin trading in China. So that's my, that's, that completes my prepared remarks. I'm happy to take more questions. We have about 15 minutes left, so it looks about right. Richard, you want to comment? Come in? Actually, I want to ask you about the business model for the exchange. Yes, yes. Okay. You know, yeah, so how, do, how do you make your money? Yeah. So let's cover that. So it turns out when we were charging uh, uh, trading commission, we were charging 0.3% one way. So if you buy, Bitcoins, we charge you 0.3%. If you sell, we charge 0.3%. Mon Gox, who, who is the person asking Mon Gox? Mon Gox charges 0.6%. So they're raking it in. They're making so much money, and we're making half as much money, but which was a lot. So we're making a lot of money back then. Uh, that's how we got VC funding. We, we, you know, we, we told the VCs, hey, we're making a lot of money. Give me more money. Uh, so, uh, so that happened. And um, so today, we've actually eliminated trading commission, but 
we, we, we're investing for the long-term growth of, of the ecosystem. We want more Bitcoin users out there. We want the infrastructure to be more developed. That's why we're doing this. So we might be burning cash in the near term, but turns out what happened was the, the, we, we still charge a little bit when you withdraw money from the bank, banking system. So there's some withdrawal fees that we do still charge uh, in our exchange. Um, so turns out, because the volumes have gone up 100 times, even based on those tiddly, those really small withdrawal fees, that's like a lot of money. So November was actually quite profitable. It's like, wow, we didn't realize that. So November was gonna, is a really profitable month, December and so on. So we're, look, we're looking pretty good in terms of our, our financial model and stuff like that. Okay, yeah. the floor is yours, go ahead. Okay, question, yes. Do you have any issues with fraud? Fraud, oh yeah, we do, we do. Okay. Uh, all kinds. People coming in pretend to be someone else, they want their money and stuff like that. Uh, yeah, all kinds, all kinds. <sighs> well, what's specific with Bitcoin is, is the finality problem. It, if you initiate a bank transfer from A to B, and then later on they determine to be fraud, Banks can reverse it, right? Bank, the two banks, you know, whether it's Wells Fargo, Bank of America, they can say, oh, that was fraud, we would reverse it. Same with credit card, right? If you get charged for something, there's fraud, we reverse it. Turns out Bitcoin, you can't. Once Bitcoin leaves account A and goes to account B, it's at the sole discretion of account B holder to, to do what they want to do with, with the Bitcoin. So you cannot reverse the Bitcoin. So that's both good and bad. In some scenarios, you want that. In other cases, in fraud activities, it's too bad. So when you have Bitcoin websites that get hacked and the Bitcoin gets stolen, then it's gone. It's, it's, it's out the door. The horses have left the, you know, the barn. Yes, okay, question here. Do you think there's a business opportunity to offer that as a service? Absolutely, absolutely. You should start a Bitcoin startup and, and you'll get funding if you can do that, absolutely. Yes, next. Yeah, back there. On that same theme, um, what do you think are some of the most exciting Bitcoin startup ideas right now? There's a whole, there's, it's unlimited. It's, the sky's the limit. I have more ideas than I can implement. So I encourage all of you to start Bitcoin companies. It's like, <laughs> no, no, seriously. I mean, it, this is the new frontier. Like some of the ones you start, some might compete with me, but it's okay, right? It's like, imagine if the internet only had one Yahoo. And that was the whole thing. That was the only company for the internet. That would be bad. We, the internet would not be where it is today. So even I worked for Yahoo, it was good to have all, all these competing companies in the ecosystem. So, so there's many ideas, you know. Can you give a couple examples? <laughs> no, I'd rather not because um, then it'll give you an impression that I'm focused on some areas and not others. So I'd rather not. But you can find them online. There's tons of ideas. I'll chat with you offline you know, about that. Yes, question? Have you thought about using like a, a market making to make money by predicting the bottom movement between uh, sell market and maker, buy? Yeah. right? Like private trading, like, yeah. like uh, what they call proprietary trading, right? Yeah. So we use customers' money to trade. Yeah, yeah. We, we, that's a that's a business model, right? You could do that, but we we as an exchange, we're not doing that. But that's I know people who are doing that. There's arbitrage business, there's market making, there's you know, there's algorithm trading and all that. Question there? Let's go to the one. Okay, uh, okay, last one there. Uh, do, could you share with us your long term vision about uh, <coughs> the Bitcoin chain? Do you do you see the long term viability of the business, or do you see that it's just a window of time that you can earn money from this business? I think it's long term. It's like the internet. They talked about internet bubble, but reality is internet usage has gone up and it will only keep going up. So yeah, question here. What warnings could you foresee happening that would reverse the Yuang stance? What? Sorry, what? What could you see happening that would reverse the Yuang stance? The U.S. stance? Yuang. The oh, Yu Yigong. Oh, Yigong. His sorry. stance on what? On it being okay and it being kosher for now and you be on the whitelist? I cannot comment on that. So it turns out in the last 12 hours, the, the government issued some rulings or some, some communique on Bitcoin. I haven't read that fully yet, so I don't want to comment on, on that information at this point. I was going to ask you to comment. I, I, I cannot, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. I, I'd be speaking out of turn. Uh, let, me, let me go read, study that, and then gather my thoughts and see the reaction, and then we'll comment on it. Yes, please. Um, even if you can't comment on the regulations, it sounds like the regulations coming out was a bit of a surprise for you, or did you expect something to be coming out? Um, we, we're actually, we're actually pro-regulation. Uh, th this may come as a surprise to some of you. We operate in China market. We want the government to regulate the Bitcoin exchange business. And, and the reason is we're the leader. So we, we want to, you know, to make this a more formal business, to, to have more rules in place so that we, we do things legitimately, we protect the customers' interests, we protect their funds. Otherwise, 
Bitcoin exchanges come up and go, they steal customers' money, they go out of business, they get hacked. So a lot of, lot of problems if it's not regulated. Yeah. Question. Other than like uh, making transfers free, right? Yes. Did you guys do anything offline? Did you guys do anything else to like uh, spur the adoption of Bitcoin? Offline, not yet. We haven't done anything offline yet. Yes. Question over here? Yes. Can you explain the difference between the exchanges and the price set of the exchange there and the bid ask? I'm sorry, the, the, the difference between the bid ask? No, between exchanges for the bid ask. Oh, oh, you mean why are exchanges around have different pricing? Oh yeah, I can talk about that. So it turns out there, there are hundreds of exchanges, or maybe not hundreds, but tens of exchanges around the world. And they all have different prices. Some are higher, some are lower. And the reason is, that's the natural market, right? The water here in Safeway in Mountain View, or Palo Alto, is at one price. But if you go to Los Angeles, it's a different price. If you go to Boston, New York, it's a different price. The reality is, if it's cheaper here, in theory, you could buy the water here and ship it to New York City and sell it there for a higher price. But you incur, the, there's a reason why it's higher there. Coin. It is, but remember, the audience is different, right? The source of the water is different, right? People who are selling it is different. The people buying it is different. So I could buy in your exchange and sell in another exchange. You, you could. That, that would be called the arbitrage business. Yeah. Question? Uh, like 10 years down the road, can you describe some ways Bitcoin's really changed the world? Uh, 10 years down the road, wow. Um, it, it's, it's the classic stuff. You could, it, it's, oh, let, let me put it this way. Bitcoin has the potential to be the first truly global unit of measurement for, for value. Think about this. And in the US, you guys are, are, are like, not you, but I'm also American, but, but we're, we're like insulated. Well, what, what, what measuring system do we use? The American system, right? Where we talk about feet and inches, where we talk about pounds, and uh, what's the other thing we use? Uh, in China and the rest of the world, they all Fahrenheit. use the metric system, right? So the metric system consists of temperature in Celsius, consists of length in meters, consists of uh, weight in kilograms, consists of, uh, what else? I'm, I'm, yeah. But the point is, the whole world uses the same system of measurement, okay? whereas the US is different. So, so if you look at currencies today, the world has you know, 100 different currencies. So the only pseudo currency that's global is the US dollar. So you know, the US dollar, I told you it's been inflating, you know, people are like questioning it and stuff like that. So Bitcoin potentially could become, you know, the, the standard where all currencies are pegged against or if, if not. So th that's a potential. I'm not going to say it will happen, but it certainly it holds that promise. Yeah, question in the back. Um, I have a quick question about like the private key. Um, if, you're, if you're selling or exchanging a um, fraction of your Bitcoin, then does it create a new private key for the people? Yeah. What happens is, remember, Bitcoins are only held in Bitcoin accounts. So if you take... You need a private key to move the Bitcoin out of the account. And every time you move it, you have to move the whole thing out. So it's kind of like this. It's kind of like you have, a, you, have a, you have a cake in your refrigerator. If I want to eat the cake, i got to open the fridge with your private key. And then what I have to do is I have to take the whole cake out first. And then I cut it. You never cut the cake in the fridge, right? You take the cake out, and then you cut it. If you have one cake or half a cake, you take it out, and you cut however much you want. And then what you can do is, because the fridge is where your account and your, your private key is the opening of the, of the fridge, then you have two pieces. You have the piece you want to eat and the piece that's left over. What you do then is you could take the piece you want to eat, you give it to whoever you want to give it to. The piece that's left over, you can either put it back in the same fridge or you can put, a new, put it in the new fridge. So most people put it into a new account. So that was a long analogy. <laughs> <laughs> it was accurate. It was accurate. Go back to the left. Uh, left, yes, over here. What do you think about the other digital currencies and do you think you're going to support them in the future? Uh, I love all the other currencies, but uh, I can't comment on what we'll do in the future. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, I have a question for the business question. So, so, so you, uh, can you like online uh, access to your exchange? So online access? Website? Yeah. yeah, we have a website. <laughs> Online without any cost, right? <laughs> oh, API, like machine. Yes, we have API access as well. Is that what you mean? You can, you can, you can buy Bitcoin. Yes. And Yoyo can sell. That's in, right. That's right. Shopify. They do that. They do that. You can buy from Monk Ox, sell it on BTC. You can buy from Bitsam, sell it on Monk Ox. You can do all that. Yeah, arbitrage. Yeah, but you're not the first to think of it. <laughs> so, what advantage does Bitcoin carry for governments, not for individuals? Because governments, sovereign governments, have always viewed this as a sovereign right. And currency, That's right. As you know, is used for control. That's right. To control of your imports and exports right. and other. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Why should a government cede that control? Because it's uh, because it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. I'll tell you. It's like the internet. It used to be that I, when I grew up in Africa, I'll tell you a story. Uh, Ivory Coast, a country, it was relatively stable. 
But you know what was the most important thing in the country? You know where they actually had armed guards? It was at the television station. That was a place in the whole city where the armed guards, the television station had a tower. So controlling the communication, the broadcast of the TV station, of the radio, was so critical for maintaining order and government, you know. So that was the Ivory Coast. In the US, we have free press and all that stuff. But pre-internet, communication was very important to countries, right? But now the internet is here, even in China today, with the Great Firewall of China, the reality is information is becoming more free. People, you and me, ordinary citizens can now broadcast and tell our stories, right? Whether it's a Twitter, it's the, you know, it's the WeChat, or, or whether it's called a WhatsApp, or you know, things like that. Uh, does that make sense? So it's, it's coming. It's, 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 it, I don't want to use the phrase unstoppable. I didn't say that unstoppable, but, but you get the idea. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, in the back? Did you? Who? who? Me? Okay, you first and then you. Yeah. Okay. So to earlier point, if I can uh, buy money from BTC China and then I sell, I sell my uh, Bitcoin on um, Mangas, that means I can transfer money, renminbi, from China, outside of China without a limitation. Because right now we have a limitation of transfer of my renminbi outside yes. of China. Yes, I could have done that too. I took a plane and flew to San Francisco. I could have carried a lot of money with me. But <laughs> right? you have a limitation. And then they asked me today, how much you brought? I was like, 600 US dollars. Okay, you go. So the point is, <laughs> there's laws and then there's breaking laws, right? <laughs> so laws are there and you can always break them, but you have to face the consequence, right? Am I right? The situation I mentioned right now, is it a consideration of violation of Chinese law? I'm not a lawyer, okay. but I, I would urge you to look at the law more carefully before I refer to it. Model like money trans transfer or money remittance, but across countries. Go for it. <laughs> no, no, I, 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 I should not have said it. Go for it. I should have said go study it first. <laughs> Bitcoin exchange makes evading capital controls easier. No, we, we, yeah, that's a good question. So we are not in the business of making evading capital easier. I want to make that very clear. We're going to have anti-money laundering rules in place. We're going to have KYC in place, and that's part of the regulation in terms of regulating Bitcoin exchanges. That's true in China, it's going to be true in the, U it's already true in the US, it's going to be true in Thailand, any, every country. I mean, basically, countries and governments will have, have the right to administer and set their own laws. And I, I'm fully supportive of that, unless you want to go to a country where there's no laws, right? So, so as a business in a country, we fall in the domain of the government of the law, legal system, so we have to follow those rules and regulations. Okay, sir, here. How do we move from currency speculation, black market transactions, to real commerce? How do we move there? Like, but over time, over time. It, it will happen, my prediction will happen by itself, organically. We'll just let it flow, we'll just let the market play out. It's like the internet, 20 years ago, who was on the internet? It was just random people, you know, putting up pictures of themselves and stuff like oh, that. And how do you go from that society to today where you have eBay and Amazon and, and real commerce going on? even with internet banking. So it, it, it'll happen, it'll happen, right? It's, it's not the force of one company or one person pushing it. It's the force of the whole society changing in that direction because they all want it to happen, right? How about prices? Oh, I'll tell you about that. This is, this is a fun part. Okay, here we go, here we go. So how many of you have more than one Bitcoin? Raise your hand. Okay, how many of you have less than one Bitcoin? Oh, wow. Interesting. So, uh, so there are a lot of you who have Bitcoins, but less than one. So, okay, this is, this is all, now we're going to talk about a little bit um, off the record sort of conversation. <laughs> okay, here's, here's why. So I'm the CEO of this, of this exchange, so I should, it's, it's my duty to, to have a neutral perspective. I should not be encouraging speculation. Am I right? You don't want, you don't want like the, you know, head of the New York Stock Exchange to say, buy, buy, buy stocks, you know. <laughs> That would be wrong, right? So, so I, I, I'm fully aware of that. But, but at the same time, I got into this spot because I believe in the future of Bitcoin. And by that definition, I believe in the future price, a future higher price of Bitcoin. That's why I am where I am today. Okay, that's, that's, that's no, there's no lie. That's the truth. So I'll tell you about my private thoughts about where the Bitcoin prices could go, but it is not a sign as to encourage you to buy Bitcoin, okay? So for example, one Bitcoin today is $1,000. And there's how many? 12 There's 12 million now, there could be at most 21 million in the next 100 years. So that's a lot. But the reality is not a lot. There's 7 billion people. Shanghai has a population of 20 million. If everyone in Shanghai bought a Bitcoin, 
you know, it'd be, it'd be over. There's, there's no more left, right? <laughs> so, uh, so, so my point is this, gold, okay? How much gold is there here? One twentieth of an ounce, right? It's about worth about 60 US dollars, you guys remembered. Um, it turns out, if I have one Bitcoin, that means I have one twenty-one millionth of the world's supply of Bitcoins. Am I right? Is that a large number? It's a large number. I mean, is that a lot of Bitcoins? It's only one. But as a fractional, it's actually quite significant. I mean, not for this room, but the whole world. Seven billion people. So if I told you, I, I'll give you one over 21 millionth of all the gold in the world. You know how much that is? Take a guess. How many of these would there be in one over 21 million? Do you, do you understand my question? Am I asking it? So if you take all the gold, so you take all the gold in, the, in the world, you slice it into 21 million pieces, and I give you one slice, how much gold would there be? More or less than this? A lot more or a little more? A lot more. Turns out it's about 5 to 10 kilograms. If I think that's about four hundred thousand dollars in today's prices, okay. So if Bitcoin were to ever have an asset value equivalent to gold, if okay, here's the big part, right? Then one Bitcoin could potentially be around four hundred thousand U.S. dollars, right? And that's only matching gold's asset class. So my prediction is Bitcoin one day has a potential to become a truly global asset class. Remember, it, there's no language, it's not English, Bitcoin is not an American thing, it's not English, it's not a Chinese, it's not a Western culture, Eastern culture thing, it's a global thing. It runs on the whole internet, right? Can it become a global, in, a global asset class? Can it become a global currency standard in 100 years, in 20 years, right? I think it has a potential. That's why we're passionate doing this company, doing the startup. Um, I think we're going to have to call on this. Yeah, it. so one, one last sentence is, if it does become that, it'll be a, become a trillion dollar asset class, which is more than 100 times where it is today.